This is Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us every day. I'm Rich Ford, and I'm here with Pam Carlin. Don't forget to subscribe or follow this feed on your favorite podcast app. That way, you'll have access to all of our episodes as soon as they're available. While lawsuits involving President Trump add up, some people may be wondering which ones are important, whether any of them are important, and why they should pay attention. But if you care about the United States, you also care about the Constitution. And a lot of the controversy around these lawsuits involving Donald Trump come back to the Constitution. So, yes, it is important, and you should pay attention. To explain why, we're going to talk today to our colleague Jack Rakoff, a historian who's well-versed in these issues. Jack's work focuses on the origins of the American Revolution and the U.S. Constitution, and the role of historians in constitutional litigation. Jack's been looking at some of the most important questions involving President Trump, such as whether he can be prosecuted for criminal wrongdoing when he was serving as president, whether the two impeachment trials matter, and if the state of Colorado's decision to disqualify him from the state's primary ballots um, because of his involvement in the insurrection January 6th is legal. Jack is a professor of history and American studies um, and a professor of political science emeritus here at Stanford, and he's also taught at the law school and is the author of many prize-winning books. Uh, Jack, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I'd just like to start with a question that may be on the minds of some of our listeners, which is whether President Trump can be prosecuted for the same things that he was unsuccessfully impeached for, or whether or not this is some kind of double jeopardy. I think it's absolutely clear this this is not a double jeopardy kind of issue. Impeachment and a criminal trial for the acts that warranted the impeachment uh, are two distinctly different processes. They should really have two different sets of regulations, uh, and they would also have two different kinds of outcomes. Uh, fast could, you know, fast could become available after a president was impeached but not convicted, or after a president uh, left office that I that I believe would still warrant uh, pursuing an impeachment uh, proceeding. You know, you probably know that Judge Ludwig, who's, who's done a lot of good work uh, in general. Uh, on the Trump-related issues, I think made a major error uh, when he argued that once he'd left office, President Trump uh, could you know, could not be impeached, and the Republicans in the Senate used that as a kind of fig leaf uh, to gut you know, to, to 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 gut the 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 second Trump impeachment trial. But I think the key thing to understand is is the the different proceedings are, are just are qualitatively and substantively different. In nature, and I think a big source of confusion has arisen, uh, certainly I think for the American public, I think to some extent for political commentators, by trying to conflate the all the due process rules that we apply to criminal trials to the kinds of the kinds of rules and concerns and uh, considerations that ought to apply to an impeachment. And I think one big problem with the impeachment clause is that, in a certain sense, we've over legalized it. We 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 thought about all these do you know let's go let's go back to Nixon's impeachment for Watergate. I mean you know, the, you know it took about a year and a half from the original discoveries in Washington in January uh, 1973 to Nixon's removal from office by resignation with his impeachment and trial uh, almost certain. Uh, and a lot of that was you know brought down with the disputes over the tapes were they protected? Did Congress have the right to see them and so on and so on? When you have an impeachment. It is the public good of the republic that is at stake. The circumstances that warrant an impeachment suggest that if there, there should be a kind of urgency to decision making, which due process norms often do not apply for reasons lawyers know, what well, historians understand, and lawyers know much more intimately and better than I do. So I just think there is there we do have we have had this kind of crazy conflation of two very different kinds of proceedings, uh, and because the outcomes are so different. And the purposes are so different to say uh, a trial following impeachment, which led to an acquittal, uh, is double jeopardy. It just strikes me. I'll use one Yiddish word that I'll translate. It's complete and utter narishkeit or foolishness. Uh, is it a <laughs> and it's all character <laughs> too. <laughs> but it's not ungepatskid. <laughs> so sometimes people, it, it's said that impeachment is a political process, whereas a criminal trial is a legal process. And maybe that um, clarifies 
some of the reasons that these processes are so different and why it's not not double jeopardy. Another question that is now on everyone's mind is whether or not the 14th Amendment applies to the office of the president and whether or not it might deem President Trump unqualified to hold office as the Supreme Court of Colorado has held recently. Right. Well, you know, that's a great discussion, which I, I've been trying to follow carefully. I can't say <laughs> I've contributed much to it myself. I'm speaking more of a late 18th century than a mid 19th yeah. century guy, though I am trying to stay on top of this. You know, I think, again, this is, uh, you know, this is pretty much a no brainer. I mean, there are ample references, you know, the kind of, putting Section 3 itself to one side and what might strike us as the curious omission of the presidency. There are nevertheless ample references in the rest of the Constitution to the president and, and also the oath of office to the president as an officer or holding the office. I mean, how can you hold an office without being an officer? And people like on the, on the historical side, people like Mark Rabel, Graber and, you know, Jerome, I might mangle his name, but Majioka, he's actually a Stanford BA, though, in fact, not my student. Um, people have worked on this fairly intensively. And Mark Graber, of course, has just published a big book uh, on all the other purposes of the 14th Amendment once you get past Section 1. Purposes of Section 1 are obvious. It, it's it's all those. It's Sections 2, 3, and 4, and, you know, the codicil of Section 5, which Mark argues, I think, quite rightly, uh, better situates contextually in what the purpose, purpose of the amendment was. So you know, it, it seems to me it's it, it's absolutely, you know, the, if, if you want, if you say the usual rule of interpretation, you have to make all provisions of the Constitution consistent with one another. Uh, there's ample reason to think that uh, this was indeed a, you know, the president is indeed an officer. I mean, what else could he be if he's not an officer? Uh, he, he is, in effect, the sole holder of the executive power, as the vesting clause of, of our, you know, Article 2, the presidential article, says. And I think, you know, the insurrection case is, you know, is is is, is pretty much the same. And again, Mark Graber, I mean, for those who follow the literature, he has, he has a couple really lengthy posts on this in balkanization which kind of go through this, you know, virtually uh, chapter and verse and, and it, you know, based based on the book uh, and, and on the book that he's just published. So, you know, uh, I mean, the Civil War is certainly, uh, you know, an insurrection and a rebellion uh, squared, I mean, you know, to the maximum extent possible. Uh, but, you know, since we now know so much about what Trump's purposes were and also the amount of planning that went, went into both the, you know, the pre-January 6th litigation and, you know, the final maneuvering, going down to what happened on January 6th. I mean, the insurrection question strikes me as a no-brainer as well. And you know, Rich, if I, if I could amplify this in one way, because uh, yeah, because I do think about this more, you know, more more as a historian than as a lawyer, is that, uh, you know, there there is a kind of, it does seem to me, I mean, there's what you guys think about this. There can be a kind of narrow linguistic, narrow, what strikes me as being narrow linguistic obsessions mm -hmm. often seem to me to characterize a lot of legal analysis, you know, that, you know, like, you know, well, you know, let's get this very technical argument about officer. You can't take the text out of constitutional interpretation <laughs> by definition. The text is the focal point, or at least the, you know, the initial source uh, of what has to be interpreted. But, you know, his, all historians reason, you know, well, when we read text, we try to read them as carefully and closely as we can. And I've learned from hanging out with lawyers that, um, you know, particularly a lot, of, a lot of stuff I did with your former Dean Larry Kramer. Uh, in, in, I learned, because you know, Larry and I taught together, and I just learned so much from Larry and bouncing our ideas off uh, off one another. There are a lot of things about legal decision-making I won't really understand or grasp. Take jurisdiction. You know, that's not <laughs> the muy complicado side of the equation. But for historians, when you read a text, you know, de rerum natura in the order of things, our way of thinking it's always contextual. You do the best job with the text you can. Make sure you, you know, you, you know, you look at, you know, whether the use of and and you know the free speech and petition, you know, the First Amendment, you know, peacefully assemble and petition. You know, you ha you have to think about that. But you know, we reason contextually, and contextually means you know, got to reconstruct the debates. You got to try to do the best to reconstruct, uh, you know, the contemporary commentary, which of course is exactly what Graeber and Oak Oka have done uh, in, in in their analysis here. So I do think that you know historians like myself, John, you know, my younger colleague Jonathan Gap, and every, you know, everybody who works on particular problems. We have a lot to contribute to the story, but we contribute is first and foremost a knowledge of context. Can I jump in there, Jack, and ask you about this? Because it's one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is 
there are historians who spend their whole lives studying a particular period uh, and the ways to think about it. And what seems to be happening now, in part because the Supreme Court claims to be an originalist court, is people jump in who have spent like 14 minutes thinking about a clause and they say, I found this one example from 1789 or from, right. you know, 1807, and it proves something. And I think historians, um, you're part of a group that the Brennan Center just announced, you know, for historians to be helpful in helping courts and lawyers think about how history can be used. Could you say a little bit about that? Oh, I'd love to. Although, you know, we're, you know, we're still getting organized since you were just announced, you know, a few days ago and, you know, the publicity, publicity has gone out and, you know, we, we did have one meeting in late September to kind of get together and start comparing notes. So, yeah, it's, you know, there are a couple of different ways to pose this. I mean, one PM is, you know, there is a big debate about originalism and, you know, as you know, and I'm sure you know, many of your listeners probably know, there is a, you know, there has been a big fissure in original circles between people who want to think historically, as I do, and those who really want to think primarily linguistically. You know, there is this kind of what's called semantic or public meaning originalism, uh, which says that, you know, I, I think its assumption is the evidence of history, though interesting in itself, is often inconclusive. And it's complicated. And it, it may not always give you the fixed determined results that originalists want, you know, you know, want, you know want to try to get. On the other side of the equation, when I first started thinking about this problem, I first started thinking about originalism before Paul Brest had invented the term. I started thinking about the early 1970s. And it seemed to me at the time that if you want to be an originalist, all questions about what Constitution originally meant must be inherently historical in nature. And when I started to work on my big book, Original Meanings, essentially my idea was to come up with what would what would historical method of answering the question of what did the clause originally mean? How would you do it? It's a kind of analytical problem, and I thought historians should you know should pay attention to it. I think the problem with that is people who now are you know committed to originalism ideologically for a whole array of purposes, you know, political or doctrinal or whatever. Uh, I think they found the hit the history to be too difficult, or maybe to be you know a bit too complicated, and maybe a bit too you know, multivocal and, and indecisive. So they come up with, it strikes me as being an interesting, but in some ways very problematic notion of, um, you know, uh, what's called semantic or public meaning originalism, which rests on modern theories of linguistics, which were among other things unavailable <laughs> to the authors of the constitution. Uh, so it depends on which linguistic theorist you've read. And it seems to me, the more I think about that, the more it seems to me that far from, um, Far from Rizzo's being a constraint on modern interpretive discretion, the linguistic game really opens it up. I mean, you know, if you're and Pam, you know this from your background as a humanist. If you're a historian, in the end, you need to have some source, some original record that will sustain or at least document, uh, provide evidence for any claim you want to make. When you start playing the language games, that obligation, I think, fades, and you're kind of—I mean, you're, you're kind of—you're delving in, in a realm of linguistic theory. But anyhow, so our agenda is to say that you know a lot of this, I think, comes specifically well out of both the Bruin decisions and also the Dobbs decisions, which I think, in some ways, are qualitatively different. And you know, I'm not sure I'd reason about them in exactly the same way. But in both cases, the court is saying, in a somewhat muddled and you know vague way, that we should we we need to have a turn to history and tradition. So the invitation is out there, and I think historians like myself who've thought about this, or you know, and I've been involved. I've you know, I've been the main author of what five or six briefs now, uh, including I'm very proud of having been the main author of the the brief in D.C. versus Heller, which I think is actually you know, well, like Jefferson, I probably want that on my tombstone, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, but uh, you know, so yeah, so you know, we are trying to we are trying to start thinking about you know what can we do both as a matter of civic responsibility and professional opportunity. Yeah, maybe, um, Jack, you could tell us a little bit more about the Supreme Court's use of history, and um, maybe you could use the Heller brief as an example of the way to the Supreme Court's using history and um, how you think they should use it. Let me let me start with Heller and then and then push me where you know where where you want to go. I tell you, as a historian, I think that we should not use the term the case was wrongly decided. Uh, I mean, to our way of thinking, the case was decided. That's you know, that's what you have to explain. Whether it's right or wrong, you know, I, I, 
yeah, I'm, I'm not prepared to go there. But I do think in Heller, that case was wrongly decided. And here's why. I mean, what I did, I, you know, I, I, I won't go through the, my own back history here, but uh, I mean, I did do a long article in the Chicago Kent Law Review from, from a conference that was held, you know, 2000, 2001, whatever, on, you know, the whole constitutional issue of the regulation of firearms. And, you know, I learned a lot from doing that article that I had not known or even thought about before. The main thing I learned, the the, the biggest takeaway I, I, I would make goes something like this. It would be that to reestablish the context within which the Second Amendment was framed. What issue was at stake? The debate was always uh, to the kind of 99.44% range. It was always about the militia. It was always going to be about the status of the militia under under, under uh, Article 1, uh, Section 8, I think it's Clause 16, which gives Congress, the you know, which in fact recognizes that the militia is, is a state-based institution, but Congress is going to have a supervisory authority to determine, how, which it, it uses its discretion determine how it would be organized, armed, and disciplined. And, and this leaves open questions about the future status of militia. And Anti-Federalist, you know, actually with, with a literature that really goes back to Machiavelli. You know, Machiavelli was the, you know, it was in some ways in terms of lowercase r, Republican political thinking. Machiavelli was the major theorist of the militia in a Republican society. And, and the prefatory phrase, uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, since since Pam is in frenzy uh, <laughs> right now, uh, the the best term used there is uno stato libero, a free state. I mean, it's a Machiavellian term. Thanks the question of what I actually mean by a free state, which is itself an independent problem. So you know, when I, when I finally went through all the sources, they are predominantly squared concerned with the status of the militia. There are a couple oddball exceptions. The most famous is a is the dissent of the minority anti-federalists at the Pennsylvania Ratification Convention. They were worried about hunting and so on. But those arguments don't go anywhere and they don't form it. And then of course the flip side of this is you know the, the you know the major outcome in Heller, and then it, it, it's amplified in McDonald and then more recently in in the Bruin versus New York Rifle Association case, and we'll see what's going to happen in the Rahimi case. Uh, you know, the argument here is that what the Second Amendment did, though, was really to constitutionalize a common law right of self-defense. There's no evidence, you know, from that period, you know, from the late, let's say the late 1780s or 1790s or whatever. There's no evidence that anyone at the time thought the Second Amendment had anything at all to do with uh, a personal right of self-defense. So uh, the Supreme Court's had a series of cases recently, you know, where, which are about politics and the regulation of politics and how that kind of intersects with their professed originalism. So, for example, they have the Chafalo case about faithless electors and could states bind the electors to decide. They had a case called Rucho against Common Cause in which they said, well, the framers would not have uh, been worried about political gerrymandering, which of course is a little crazy since as I understand the framers, they thought they were setting up a system that wasn't going to have political parties at all, which makes it a little strange to think, but they didn't care if political parties uh, emerged in this. And then of course, there's the more against Harper case, which I know Jack, you have particular interest in, and that's a case about whether uh, that's a case about something called the independent state legislature doctrine. Could you tell us a little bit about how you think the court thought about history in that case? You know, Pam, I am so, for obvious reasons, I'm so happy you asked me this question. I, I have actually, I mean, I'm going to, you know, toot my own horn again, but I, I, I've been the main author of three reapportionment related cases, going back to the Veith versus Jubilee. Remember, we were, we were at that uh, that time I went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Yes. We the Jubilee yes. here was there. Um, I was the, I was the main author of the brief in the Arizona redistricting. You know, he's still at that conference every year. I yeah, see yeah, him. Yeah, the, yeah well, I only went the one time. I, yeah, I know you go annually. And then also, you know, actually with the support of the Brennan Center, I was, I guess I was the lead author in, um, you know, in the Moore versus Harper case with its uh, uh, independent state legislature theory, which again is another one of those examples of work my way around this of how, 
if you take a, a merely linguistic approach, you come up with arguments that, uh, from a story's perspective, uh, are a deeply counterintuitive, b badly flawed, and really probably not worth not worth very much uh, at the end of the day. So let me do a little bit. Let me do a quick bit of history here, and because uh, I have a whole chapter in in my book, Original Meanings on representation, which uh, the starting point there is, is that it was a commonplace of 18th century American thinking that a representative assembly, or let's say the lower house of a legislature should be, these are the terms I used, a mirror, a miniature, a portrait, or a transcript of a larger society. John Adams, for example, used that language in his, in his influential pamphlet, Thoughts on Government, in 1776, for a long time, I wondered where where the phrase came from. It turns out it actually came from a an English a pro Parliament polemicist during the English Civil War of the 1640s. A guy named Henry Parker was actually the guy who came up with his image, with the Americans you know kind of bought into, and that became something of a cliche in American political thinking. The idea that the representative assembly should be a mirror, miniature, portrait, transcript. That's why, just in a general sense, you put all the reinforcement cases together. It strikes me as being kind of completely well, either deeply problematic or, since we're using Yiddish today, completely Meshuggah. Makakta. <laughs> I'll say Meshuggah here. You know, that, um, you know, the, the court wants, you know, wants to avoid getting involved in gerrymandering. I mean, I do think it was, it was, a, it was a fundamental, you know, with or without political parties. Uh, you know, political parties obviously refine and complicate the question, but, you know, whether you think about this in terms of party, just think about it in other terms. But the idea of a kind of one person, one vote, what we now call one person, one vote standard was, you know, not just implicitly, was part of the conceptual apparatus of the founding generation. So the court for to say, I think Robert's phrase in one of the cases, this is Oh, you know, I, I think the one involving the efficiency standard, where it's called, this, this is somewhat sociological. Yeah, that's in you know, gobbledygook. You know, and, you know, Roberts was a history major at Harvard. In fact, he, he almost could have been my student, although he wasn't. It didn't work out that way. But in any case, you know, the idea, you know, I mean, the court's refusal strikes me as being, on historical grounds, uh, deeply problematic. So there are things I can say about different cases, but that's the general point. Let's go to let's go to the Independent State Legislature decision. So again, that's the logic of that case takes off directly from the text of the elections clause, which I guess is what Article One, Section Four, if I remember correctly, of the uh, of the of, of of the Constitution. You know, and it's I mean we we uh, well, we won't, don't have to go back through the whole text. Um, one of the curious things about the about the opinions, you know, both in and not about the brief we submitted, because the brief we submitted, we made a big deal about this. Is, um, if you want to ask what was the purpose of the elections clause, okay, I need to back up in a second. The underlying theory for the proponents of the independent state legislature theory was that the framers had placed a, a high value on maintaining the the supreme the superior supreme authority of the state legislatures in terms of determining how congressional districts, you know, for the House of Representatives or, you know, or, or how people would be represented in the House of Representatives uh, and so on. To the exclusion or to, let's say, to the minimization of the other branches of government playing some kind of advice and advisory contingent role, depending on circumstances. And of course, you know, the, the COVID pandemic, you know, and, and the disruption it created would be one kind of circumstance that you might want to have other branches of government capable of responding to in a kind of, you know, short, in, 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 in a short-term way. So what struck me as being, you know, really strange about the opinions is that no one discussed the debate in the federal convention on the, you know, uh, on the election clause as it's recorded in Madison's notes of debate, which remain, you know, our, 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 you know, our dominant source for, you know, the, the, the debates at the convention, though, if you know Mary Builder's book, Madison's Hand, you realize historians are asking some interesting questions about, you know, uh, or Madison's notes equally valid for every, you know, every period from late May down to, down to mid-September. But what, hey, what Madison's notes seem to reveal uh, and the exact citation for those who want to read it online, if you go to the second volume of Max Ferrand's Records of the Federal Convention of 1787, pages 240 and 241, there are five or six speakers. Madison seems to have been, you know, the most long-winded, or at least certainly wanted to have his own thoughts recorded and memorialized. But what what the whole what that whole debate reveals, whether you emphasize Madison's remarks on the one hand or just you know, the overall context is 
it's the doubts and suspicions about the state legislatures. It's the, it, it's, it's, the, it's the idea that they're not reliable. That, that, was, that was the dominant animus behind the whole debate. So for, to me as a historian, to reach a kind of strong decision, well, I mean, the, in the end we have the right decision, but, you know, but to reach it without taking into account what were the animating purposes behind the clause itself strikes me as being kind of a rather foolish way to pursue what the Constitution originally meant. Thank you so much, Jack, for clarifying some of the uses of history, um, particularly at a time when the court is um, operating increasingly along lines of originalism. This is Stanford Legal. If you're enjoying the show, please tell a friend and leave us a rating on your favorite podcast app. It'll help us improve the show and get the word out that we're back. I'm Rich Ford, along with Pam Carlin. See you next time.